So, uh, welcome, Yancey. Thanks. We, uh, we wrote about Kickstarter last March, and if you'll forgive me, I have to go to my cards here, because at the time, uh, we, we led, our, our story started with an example of a company that had built a mount for a camera strap. They were asking for $15,000, and they raised $63,000 in six weeks, and we thought that was pretty incredible, $63,000 in six weeks. Uh, in Febru on February 10th, I believe it was, a video game company called Double Fine raised a million dollars in a day. And uh, as Mark and Chris were discussing, uh, and as you might have read on the uh, front page of the business section of the New York Times yesterday, a watch company called Pebble uh, has now raised uh, $7 million in four weeks. It's a great sign of the explosive growth of the Kickstarter platform. Um, it now uh, rivals the NEA in terms of the, the amount of uh, arts projects that it funds. Uh, and Yancey's here to talk a little bit about, about on, its, on, on its third birthday, sort of right. the, state, the state of the Kickstarter platform. So, uh, so where, is, where is Kickstarter at right now? Give me some sense of, of the shape of that business. Sure. Uh, well, Saturday was, uh, was Kickstarter's third birthday. So the site launched on April 28th, 2009. Uh, we celebrated with a party in bed -Stuy. It was fun. Uh, but, you know, to date, as of now, um, about 2 million people have backed a project on Kickstarter. Uh, there have been about 22,000 projects that have been successfully funded. And collectively, there's been over $200 million that's moved through the system. Um, and so it's growing a lot. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the, the Double Fine project that raised a million dollars in a day. That was about 10 weeks ago. Um, and there, there hadn't been a project raising a million dollars uh, before that day, and that day there were two projects that did it, and there have been six that have done it in the past 10 weeks. Um, and so it's definitely peaking in some kind of way, uh, and it's also just been, there have been some really great projects that, that have come along, but um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting time. Now, is there anybody out there, you may be too embarrassed to raise your hand, who, who doesn't know how Kickstarter works? Okay, so we don't have to do that. Okay, great. Um, so what, what do you think the, why the explosive growth? Is it just that more people are using Kickstarter? Are the projects getting better or more ambitious? Are people, what's, what's, the, what's changing? Well, I think that um, you know, people are learning the best way to use it, to use the platform, and, and we don't even know the best way to use it. There was actually very little instructional copy on the Kickstarter site for the first two years because we thought this is a new thing. We actually don't know the right way to do things, so how could we say? It's better if people just learn from each other. And I think there's a nice knowledge base that a lot of people are drawing from that has been very helpful. I think the other thing that's helped is just that people, uh, you know, you don't have to explain what Kickstarter is as much anymore, I guess, as that just showed. Right. Uh, before, you know, maybe 30% of people's videos would have to be explaining how Kickstarter works, and that's just maybe not as sexy or, or as creative as, as other things people might do. Um, but, you know, we always thought that for us, you know, for Kickstarter to grow, it would, it would take a long time because it was uh, kind of a new thing to talk about money in public in this way, to engage with an audience in exactly this way, and that it might take some time for people to get used to. Um, and so I, I think that, that that's happening. Uh, but it's interesting. I mean, there's still some, some segments, some creative worlds that are more comfortable with Kickstarter than others. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's, it's kind of strange to talk about money in public sometimes and say for fine artists or for like cool rock bands, mm -hmm. you know, they're not so sure about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think there's still, there's still a, lot, a lot farther to go in, in a, lot of the, a lot of the mediums out there. Mm -hmm. And it, can you give an example of, uh, 
any current projects that are out there that you're particularly fond of or that, that use Kickstarter in the correct, you know? Well, you know, it's funny. There, you guys wrote about them in, in a couple issues ago, but, but Bob Lefsitz had a great, a great little rant about Kickstarter today where he's pointing at the pebble and pointing to musicians for not using it in the right way. He said, I should say Bob Lefsitz is a, is a music industry sort of expert and uh, raconteur uh, and a blogger who writes these sort of cranky, uh, posts about what, why music, the music industry is, is terrible. Sure. <laughs> and I used to be in the music industry, so I was a rock critic for, for about eight years before, before Kickstarter. Uh, but he had a really good piece just about how, how bands should think about Kickstarter, how they should think about it's not about you, it's about doing something for your audience. And I think that's, I think that's right. I think that, that is the right way to think about it. And yesterday, a, a woman named Amanda Palmer, who used to be on a record label and got dropped, and she's sort of queen of the internet uh, in some ways. And she launched a project yesterday, and she's raised a quarter million dollars in the first 24 hours. And so we're used to seeing those kinds of totals only being for gadgets. Mm -hmm. That's what people talk about for Kickstarter with those kinds of explosive things, gadgets. But I think it's, you know, the, the growth or, or the potential of any project is just relative to who started it. So for, for Amanda Palmer to do that much in the first day is, is really awesome and really exciting. Uh, and I think it's a reflection uh, of what she brings to the table and also just the malleability of Kickstarter as a platform. You know, if, if, if Quentin Tarantino wanted to launch a project tomorrow, he could probably raise $25 million. Right. You know, it, it, everyone has their own, uh, their own shadow that they cast and, and an audience that they can bring. And it's been interesting to watch, you know, Kickstarter began as a fairly modest platform for arts projects, people recording their CDs or what have you. And before long, you start seeing all these other kinds of projects involved. You mentioned gadgets being a big one, uh, design projects, video games, and uh, uh, restaurants are actually sort of pre-funding uh, mm -hmm. using Kickstarter. So what, how does that change what you do? How does that change the character of Kickstarter? Well, you know, we really, we really stick hard to this idea that Kickstarter is for creative projects. And, um, Admittedly, creative projects is a pretty fuzzy phrase. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to precisely define it. We really just mean things by people, things that spring from the imagination. Um, we really like projects that are someone uh, pursuing some kind of creative expression more than some you know, maximization. Uh, and, and so we do have a bias in that kind of way. Um, I mean, the, what really drove us to start Kickstarter, I mean, uh, Perry Chen, who's our CEO um, and, and a co-founder, uh, he first had this idea over 10 years ago, and he had it when he was living in New Orleans, and he wanted to put on a concert. And there's a lot of reasons why it couldn't happen. He thought if only people could have paid beforehand, and then if enough people paid, the show would happen. If not, it wouldn't happen. This way to sort of test, test an idea. Um, and when we were really working on it early on, what we were driven by was just this notion that the only uh, ideas in the world that really had much value that could find support from traditional uh, forms of funding were ideas that could make money, were things that were good investments, um, things that were business ideas. But if you had something that was just creative, just something stuck in your head that you just wanted to see exist in the real world, and that was really the extent of your ambition, you know, you didn't have a lot of options. Um, if you had a rich uncle, that would work. If you had, you know, a credit card, you could, you know, rack up a lot of debt on, that could work. Um, but it was, it wasn't easy. And so we like this idea of, of creating a space where things could happen simply because people wanted them to. And there was no greater interest than that. And so I, I think that that's what Kickstarter has done. Um, and, and we're particularly proud of that being done for the kind of idiosyncratic you know, projects that wouldn't happen anywhere else. I think those are the ones that we feel most romantically about. Um, but yeah, but it has extended to, to do a lot of other things just because it's a, it, you know, it's a platform. It's a platform that people can do a lot of other things with. Um, so that, yeah, there are, there are a lot of these design and these technology things now. <laughs> Uh, but they still make up a, a, a very small minority of what happens on the site. Um, Tech-related projects uh, make up about 5% of the total projects on the site. Um, but if you read the internet, it appears they make up 99% of <laughs> what happens on Kickstarter. I understand they're exciting and, you know, an iPhone accessory is something a lot of people connect with because everyone has an iPhone. Um, and it's not so true for some theater production, you know, in Soho. Um, but it's still the theater production in Soho uh, the documentarian going to South America to make a, a, a movie about the Amazon, that is still uh, the vast majority of what's happening on the site. But how much of the funding, you know, the, the, the percentage of the projects may be 5%, but how much it's, of the money? It's 5% of the, uh, it's 95% of the projects and 85% of the money. 
Mm -hmm. So, you know, definitely these, these design and technology projects do have a, a blockbuster potential that, that is often seen. The, the Pebble going right now is a good example. Right. Um, and so that's true, but there's still, you know, film is, film is the largest category. And film is also the place where Kickstarter's had the most real world impact. Um, so this year has been exciting. There were 17 Kickstarter funded films at the Sundance Film Festival. There were 33 at South by Southwest. There were 12 here at Tribeca last week, and that's well over 10% of the entire slates of three of the most prestigious film festivals in the world. And Cannes is coming up in a couple weeks, and I think it will be similar there too. And so there you're seeing a real world impact of these things that the internet is making that might seem like they're novelties or you know, less real in some kind of way. Um, they're being honored by you know, the toughest critics, the toughest curators in the world. Right. And so you know, these things are real. Which is great. But let's go back to that 15%. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, you know, when a, when a company raises $7 million on Kickstarter based on a five-minute video and a, and a blog post, you know, what, that has to raise a lot of challenges for everybody, for you, for the, uh, for the founders themselves, for the funders. How do you kind of police this? How do you, you know, it's easy to imagine a super villain reading the business section of the New York Times and saying, $7 million, huh? Like, well, how am I going to yeah. get some of this? Well, you know, we don't, we don't investigate projects. Um, we, have a, we have a screening system when things come in. And, and basically, you build your project, and then you submit it to Kickstarter for review. And we're checking it against a set of guidelines. And the guidelines list three things, four things. Um, has to be a, a project, meaning it has a beginning and an end. It's not open-ended. So I see starting a business something that's not a project because it, it requires maintenance to exist. You know, This will produce something. That's a project. Uh, has to fit one of the categories in the site. There are 13. They're all kind of in the creative space. Um, and it can't be a charity project, and it can't be a fund my life project. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and that's it. So we screen based on that. Um, when someone says, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to make a watch, I'm going to go make a record, um, you know, we don't call up the studio where they're thinking about making the record to say, are these guys really making the record? Uh, you know, if, if something, if something is really, doesn't have a lot of information, uh, we'll ask them to add more information, but you know we're not we're not checking any of these things. Um, and what we're relying on is the fact that you have the millions of people who are using the web and and these people's networks that are really vetting the projects for everyone else because there is an all or nothing funding system. If enough people support a project, it happens and it, it gets its money. If enough people don't, it doesn't happen. And and 56% of projects don't meet their goal. So those are the ones that the crowd is saying, no, we, we're not interested in this. So there's a, a policing that happens there. Um, but really, you know, we're, we're relying on, on the crowd to do that. And we don't want to get more involved in that because I think then, then you just become another gatekeeper. Um, and especially because a lot of the things that people are doing are very ambitious. You know, we've had two projects in the past year that would hugely affect the infrastructure of New York City. One was the Plus Pool, which is these, these designers uh, from Columbia have designed this porous membrane that you can drop into a body of water and it will cleanse the water that moves through it. And their idea is to drop this in the East River and turn the East River into a swimming pool. Um, uh, it's, it's incredible. Who wouldn't, yeah, wanna... who wouldn't want that? Right. Uh, and so that's one. Another one is one that just finished called The Low Line, which is from another, a couple uh, other urban designers here in the city. And there's uh, right by the Kickstarter office, the, the Lancy Street Station in, in the Lower East Side, there's an abandoned terminal in there. You can see it from the JMZ platform. And they want to turn it into a park. Uh, and they have these fiber optic cables that will bring sunlight down below the ground. And both of these projects are incredibly ambitious. And if we are judging these from the perspective of a bank loan officer or, you know, or venture capitalist or anything like that, we're going to say, this is pretty ridiculous. Uh, but instead, these people are just appealing to, to regular people. And they're saying, you know, do you like this? Is this, does this capture your imagination? Is this something that you're into? And both projects were funded and, and have a nice head of steam behind them as a result. Um, so we like being, that, being just that opportunity for people, being a place that is about creativity and that is about opportunity and where people can have their chance. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that, right, the whole point is that, you, not that you're a different kind of gatekeeper, but that you're not a gatekeeper at all. So you have a... Well, but we are. I mean, that's, that's, I mean it's, it's not entirely true. I mean, we, have, we, have, we have rules, right? We've, set, we've created a space, we've determined rules for a space, and then we say, come and use this. So there are, we are gatekeepers in the sense that you can't raise money for charity. Right. But, but yes, we want to be, you know, for, for, I think it's for, 
seven or eight of the 13 categories on Kickstarter, we accept 95 plus percent of the projects that come in. Now, at the same time, you know, Chris, in discussing Kickstarter with Mark just now, referred to Kickstarter's place to pre-order products. Um, and I wonder, as people come to associate the site because of the great work of Wired Magazine and others, uh, with, with commercial products, and as Gizmodo links to these amazing set of headphones that are up on Kickstarter, you know, we talked about this a little bit about the danger of it being seen as a commercial transaction as opposed to a funding mechanism. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, about that distinction? Yeah, I mean, it's a, chal it's a challenging thing because we have a, a, a large swath of Kickstarter is functioning as a, as a patronage system in a lot of ways. It's a mix of patronage and commerce. It's a lot of people going on and supporting their friends or people whose work that they like and they're saying, cool, you know, go do your thing, good luck. And, and you know, they'll get a ticket to the show when the show happens, but it's not, there's, so there's some self-interest, uh, but there's something else there too. For these other kinds of projects, they are functioning more like uh, a store uh, and a storefront, and it is kind of a separate business. You know, right. we kind of have two businesses within Kickstarter right now. Um, and those things are, are more challenging in the sense that, you know, we're used to, especially the past 10 years of the global supply chain of, you order something on Amazon and it magically shows up on your door in two days. And you know, we don't think about how the things that we own and consume get made. And we just, we're not as connected with it. Um, and so the thing that you find with a lot of Kickstarter projects is that things take a long time. It's not very easy to manufacture something. Prototyping something is very difficult. You know? And so there are a lot of delays. Um, and so you know, really, I think my concern is, is for backers to understand that they are likely buying something that doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like the pebble guy has a warehouse in Ohio just stacked with boxes of pebbles right now. He has to make these things. And, you know, even for experienced designers, that does not go perfectly. Um, and so I think, that, I think that there's a part of that that's really exciting because you get to see how things get made and you get to learn and you get a sense of this thing that I'm going to wear on my wrist has an author and there's a process to it. And it's not just something that magically came to exist. And I think that belief is one that's allowed us to you know, create landfill everywhere because we think, you know, who cares? Right. It's, you know, it's, it's very simple. Uh, and, and so I think that that is good, but, but people need to have the right expectations going in. Um, but as, you know, as a business, um, yeah, we have a sense of what we think Kickstarter is. Uh, other people have a different sense of what it is. And I suspect a lot of, uh, a lot of platforms, a lot of companies have to go through things like this. Um, hopefully it's meeting in the middle is, is, where, is, is where this nets out. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've actually been, we've been kind of resistant to these projects for a while. It's taken us a while to get used to them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know, I guess we're just difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, uh, this is the last question. Unfortunately, we do not have time for Q&A, but we're going to go into a break and Yancey will be around, so feel free to uh, tackle him and ask him your question. Um, <laughs> Interesting. With these different, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, with these, uh, so you have a, maybe a different vision for Kickstarter than some of your, us your users do. Any sense of where Kickstarter is three years from now? It's obviously changed a lot in the last three years. What, what happens in the next three years? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that our ambitions for Kickstarter are what you see. Um, you know, the, what, what drove us in, in starting this was uh, a desire to create a place where people could just do things. And they could do things with their friends, with their communities. Um, and that's it, you know, and, 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 that, and that happens, and that works. Um, you know, it's, you know, Kickstarter is not your VC, it's, it's your community. Right. And, you know, you have to think about it in that kind of way. Um, and so, you know, I hope that we can just keep doing that. I mean, I, there, isn't, there isn't any grand shift, there isn't any other idea for what we're doing. I, I think that we feel fortunate to, to be able to do something that we really believe in, and that is really working for a lot of people. Um, you know, I talk about, you know, $200 million or, or 20,000 plus projects, but those are individuals. Those are 20,000 ideas that might not have happened otherwise. Maybe they would have in some other way and they would have been under more onerous terms and it would have caused a little more sweat and a little more blood than it would have otherwise. But, you know, those are, those are real things. I mean, the Kickstarter growing is, is just the aggregate growth of a lot of people. And, and it, is, it is just, it is, they, are, they are networks, you know, every project is, is a is us, it's some us, of some group of people deciding together to do something. Uh, and I, I think that's really exciting and, and, and that's what we're really interested in. I mean, we don't allow corporations to use Kickstarter, really. Uh, we don't allow advertising on Kickstarter. We've kept it a place that is by the audience, for the audience. And, and I think that its future will be very similar. 
Um, and it's exciting because there's a lot that just we as individuals are capable of doing uh, you know, when we band together around ideas. Great. Thanks a lot, Yancy. Appreciate right. it. Thanks.